Hi guys, so let's just get right into business and let's talk about gout. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's medical review series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is here on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at gout. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend. We continue doing videos on the channel. And here we go. So here's our warm up OSCE station. Study the image and answer the questions that follow. What is the clinical sign shown in the image? What is the diagnosis? List the differential diagnosis based on the image. What two tests would you do to confirm the diagnosis? Mention one drug that is used to treat this condition. What advice would you give this patient who keeps presenting to the hospital in severe pain despite taking all his prescribed drugs accordingly? You may pause the video, have a look at the image, write down your answers, scream them at, at your screen, and I will give you the answers at the end of this very quick lecture. So before I actually dive into details of talking about what gout is, I just want you to have a perspective of where uric acid comes from. Remember that inside the nucleus of many different cells in the body, you have what I refer to as the genetic material, pretty much your DNA, which can also be used to make RNA. And these are made up predominantly of nucleic acids, pretty much purines and pyrimidines. Now, uric acid is mostly coming from the purine metabolism. So as we can see here, we have the guanosine monophosphate and adenosine monophosphate, which are pretty much components of nucleotides. So they're going to be broken down by nucleotidase. Then this is going to be releasing guanosine. Then this will be broken down further to uh, guanine and then eventually this is going to be deaminated into uric acid. On the other hand, amino uh, or the AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate, is going to be converted to adenosine. Then by the presence of adenosine deaminase, it's going to be changed to inosine. Then ipoxanthine. Then after that, this is going to be converted by xanthine oxidase into xanthine. Um, the xanthine oxidase is a very important enzyme because we can give drugs that can actually target this enzyme. Then, of course, the xanthine is going to be converted to uric acid. So this is where the uric acid is actually coming from, a, a, a big overview of this from biochemistry. If you want a detailed lecture on this, just visit a biochemistry textbook. So what do I mean by when we talk about gout? These are just pretty much a group of disorders that are going to be affecting purine metabolism. So they're going to be characterized by Increase in serum uric acid levels, which is your hyperuricemia. Deposition of these uric acid crystals in both the joint tissues, that's the articular tissue, and other tissues outside the joints, which we call extra-articular tissues. Now, just an individual just having high levels of uric acid doesn't necessarily make the diagnosis of gout just from high levels of uric acid because actually it's only 10% of patients that do actually have gout that also coincidentally have hyperuricemia. So just an increase in the levels of uric acid level is not just enough for you to make a diagnosis of gout. What actually causes gout? Remember that these syndromes are either going to be episodic or constant elevation of serum uric acid levels greater than 7 milligrams per deciliter. And it's going to be as a result of two main things. It's either overproduction, where you're actually synthesizing greater than normal amounts of uric acid from a new pathway and remember that these patients are going to be excreting the normal amounts of uric acid in the urine that's greater than a thousand milligrams per day so this could be either due to primary what you call primary gout where there is a purine pathway enzyme defect or secondary gout which is usually due to increased cell turnover or cellular destruction because the more you're killing off these cells the more uric acid is being formed. So it could be related to alcohol use, hematological malignancies, chronic hemolysis, chemotherapy, which is your so-called tumor lysis syndrome. Or indeed, it could be something that is reducing the excretion of uric acid from the kidneys. Because remember that the uric acid has to be excreted in the kidneys. And the urinary excretion is going to be less than 700 milligrams per day. 
then this could be drugs like diuretics, alcohol, aspirin, which may interfere with the tubular handling of urate. And then renal diseases like chronic renal failure, lead nephropathy, even some inherited disorders that could largely decrease the excretion of uric acid in the urine. So this is accounting for mo the majority of the patients and only 10% are seen with overproduction. There are some conditions that are associated with gout, such as obesity. Remember, the there are higher levels of uric acid levels with patients that have a greater body weight. Diabetes is also another common thing with patients with gout, hypertension, hyperlipidemias, as well as atherosclerosis. Some things that may precipitate an acute gouty attack include things like dietary excess of, let's say, certain foods like sardines, anchovies, trouts. You may have trauma, you may have surgery, you may have excessive alcohol ingestion, ACTH or glucocorticoid withdrawal, hypouricemic therapy. We shall see a little bit about this in the management as well as serious other medical illnesses such as a myocardial infarction as well as a stroke. Now, what clinical features do we have? These largely depend on the clinical stages, which are predominantly four main types of stages. Asymptomatic stage or the asymptomatic hyperuricemia, an acute gouty arthritis, an intercritical gout, and a chronic tophaceous gout. And take note that renal complications can actually happen at any of these stages, but the nephrolithiasis, which is the kidney stones, which are due to um, uric acid stones, are one of the common clinical presentations when you have renal involvement. So proteinuria and even impaired ability to concentrate the urine may actually be associated with deposition of these crystals, especially in the renal interstitium, which is seen in some gout patients. So the patients start off as, as being asymptomatic, so they just have a raised level of uric acid in the blood. So they may not have any symptoms or clinical evidence of deposition of the uric acid crystals like arthritis, the toffee, the, the nephropathy, or even the uric acid stones. And these patients often have an increased risk for nephrolithiasis or acute obstructive nephropathies. Then if this isn't managed, they'll get into an acute gouty arthritis, which is, would be pretty much the first presentation of a gouty attack. So this may either be a secondary or sometimes even a primary manifestation of gout. So they're going to present you with these extremely painful joints. It will have a sudden onset. And most commonly, it's going to be affecting the middle-aged or elderly men who have been asymptomatic for quite some time. So they may just have had high levels of uric acid for about 20 to 30 years before the first attack. Premenopause women are generally not affected because of the effects of estrogen on the clearance of uric acid. But when we come to the postmenopausal women, you have them being affected, especially those that have hypertension. It's very rare for you to see it in the teenagers and those below the age of 20. And usually it may be associated with primary or some secondary disorders of uric acid overproduction. Now, what, how is it going to present? Generally, the most commonly affected joints are the metatarsophalangeal joints, which is known as portogrel uh, type of gout. Then you have an acute onset, which is severe. The joint will be painful. It will be tender. It will be swollen. And it may affect other joints, such as the tarsal joints, the ankle and the knee. And remember that many of these attacks happen suddenly at night. They evolve very quickly such that the joint becomes red, it becomes swollen, it becomes tender, and it becomes warm. You may also have intensive joint inflammation that can extend into the soft tissue, and this can be very similar to cellulitis. It can be very similar to phlebitis. Then you may have fever, which can occur with the severe attacks. And remember, polyarticular involvement can also occur, but gout is usually just generally a cause of monoarticular arthritis. Then you may have this acute attack actually resolving within a few days, about 3 to 10 days, or it can extend several weeks, and the affected joint usually returns to normal between the attacks, and the patients usually don't have any residual symptoms until the next episode. Then this is going to be the third stage, the intercritical gout, where after they have that initial attack, they will become asymptomatic. So they may have these recurrent attacks or recurrent new attacks during this stage, and these attacks usually tend to become polyarticular and they become more severe over time. And some patients can actually even develop chronic inflammation without asymptomatic intervals, leading to a condition that may actually even resemble rheumatoid arthritis. Then if this patient is not treated, then they will progress into a chronic tophaceous gout, which is, you can think of it as probably the end stage of this condition. So here they're going to be developing when the patients are not treated and they have this collection of uric acid crystals which are known as tophus 
or TOFI for plural, which are going to be surrounded by inflammatory cells and fibrosis. So typically these tophaceous deposits can be seen in the pinna of the ear, the surfaces of chronically involved joints, subchondral bones, as well as even the extensor surfaces of the forearm, the olecranon, and even the intrapatella and the Achilles tendon. So what investigations are we going to do? So if you get a patient and you have acute gouty arthritis, so you want to first aspirate and get the synovial fluid for analysis, so you want to demonstrate the urate crystals, especially the intracellular crystals, this is actually quite diagnostic for gout. Then the synovial fluid is going to be having about 10,000 to 60,000 white blood cells per mil, which are predominantly going to be neutrophils, which are going to be the common thing of an acute attack. Serum uric acid levels are not actually quite helpful in, in an acute sense because generally the serum uric acid concentration may even be normal and in about 10% of the patients at the time of diagnosis, those are the only ones that generally have an increase in uric acid levels and uric acid levels can increase because of many other reasons. So it can only use or we can only use uric acid levels to actually gauge the effectivity of the hypouricemic therapy, how well the treatment is working. Then with chronic tophaceous gout, pretty much your physical appearance will give you a hint. So the tophi are going to be firm, mobile, they'll be superficially located. They may sometimes ulcerate and give out this chalky like material exudates. Then when you get a radiology scan, remember that the tophaceous deposits are going to be appearing as a well-defined erosion. So it's a punched out erosion of the subchondral bone. Then you may have these erosions being common at the first metatarsophalangeal joint and at the base of the head of the phalanges, but any joint can actually be affected. And typically the gouty erosions have an overhanging edge of the subchondral new bone formation. You may also aspirate and the tophi can be aspirated and crystals can also be demonstrated in chronic tophaceous gout. Now, how exactly do we manage? If this patient is asymptomatic, no further treatment is actually required. If they come in with an acute gouty attack, therapy is actually most affected or effective when you start the treatment early as soon as the symptoms begin. So generally, we're going to be giving cochicin, which is, has inflammatory effects. And if we're given early, it's effective in 85% of the patients. So we start off at a 0.6 milligrams um, orally. It's given every one hour until the relief of the symptoms or until the gastrointestinal toxicity occurs, whichever one comes first. So it may also be given intravenously during an acute attack in patients who can't swallow the oral medication. Another drug that we can use are pretty much NSAIDs. These are used in high but quickly tapered out doses. So drugs like aspirin that actually do affect the clearance of uric acid in the kidneys should be avoided. So generally we can give ibuprofen 800 milligrams orally three times a day. That's quite a high dose, but you should actually reduce it over time. Diclofenac 25 to 50 milligrams three times a day orally. Endomethacin 25 to 50 milligrams orally three times a day. Corticosteroids can also be given prednisolone 30 to 50 milligrams per day as an initial dose, then you taper it off over five to seven days. Then we may sometimes even inject these corticosteroids within the joints to actually treat single joints, and this is actually useful uh, when other agents are contraindicated. So drugs that actually alter the level of serum uric acid levels should be avoided. So drugs like allopurinol, the probenicid should be avoided in an acute attack. This is just only because if we lower the levels of uric acid in the blood, this may actually induce the release of certain crystals into the joints and actually may even prolong the attack. Then in the intercritical gout, we just give prophylactic treatment with small doses of cochicin, 0.6 milligrams once a day or twice a day, or small doses of NSAIDs to prevent new attacks. Then when the patient has a chronic tophaceous gout, the aim is pretty much to control the uric acid levels, to reduce the serum uric acid levels to less than 5 milligrams per deciliter. So we can give a group of drugs that are known as uricosurics, a drug like probenicid, which is actually going to facilitate the increase in the excretion of uric acid. So it can be used in patients actually who excrete less than 700 milligrams of uric acid a day and who have no more renal function and no other history of renal stones. So the dosage is going to be 200 milligrams orally twice a day, and then we increase it gradually as needed up to a maximum dose of 2 grams. We can give xanthine oxidase inhibitors like allopurinol, which are going to be competitively inhibiting that enzyme that I talked about on the first slide, xanthine oxidase. And this is actually the drug that is preferred in patients with urate uh, excretion levels in the urine that are greater than 1,000 milligrams per day and a creatinine clearance less than 30 milligrams, uh, or 30 mils per minute rather, 
and tophaceous gout or even a history of nephrolithiasis, we can give allopurinol. The dose is 300 milligrams as a single morning dose initially, but we can increase this up to 800 milligrams as needed. So the dosage is actually reduced in the presence of renal failure to avoid further toxicity. Of course, do also advise this patient to reduce or cut down on the meats and all that, things that can trigger gout attacks. Coming back to our warm-up question, study the image and answer the questions. What is the clinical sign shown in the image? So these are TOFI. What is the diagnosis? This is chronic tophaceous gout. List one differential diagnosis. So this could be rheumatoid arthritis because it seems to have a bilateral involvement. Then what two tests would you do to confirm the diagnosis? So serum uric acid levels. You may also get joint aspirate analysis and an x-ray. Then one drug that can be used to treat this condition, cochicine and allopurinol. Then what advice would you give this patient who keeps presenting to the hospital in severe pain despite taking all the prescribed drugs accordingly? So weight loss because obesity is associated with gout. Reduction in the dietary purines like alcohol beverages, some fishes like sardines, anchovies, trouts, some certain meats like bacon, turkey, as well as a liver. I really hope you understood about gout and you enjoyed learning about this topic in rheumatology. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so that you never miss such content on a daily basis. To Zambia and beyond, until the next video, bye-bye.